Logging railways around the world were dangerous and hard going for both the men and equipment that worked on them. The poorly laid rails, tight bends, and heavy loads meant that locomotives needed to be specially designed to work on them, as normal engines would be too heavy or struggle to traverse the rails without significant modification. As a result, many logging railroads built their own slapdash locomotives to do the work, but these weren't always reliable. Then, one day, the solution to many logging railways' problems arrived in the form of a climax. In 1875, a man by the name of Charles D. Scott ran a successful logging railway in Spartansburg, Pennsylvania. Despite only having a limited education, Scott was quite mechanically gifted and had designed his own locomotive to work on the line around the mill. Despite its relatively scruffy nature, the locomotive was quite effective on the railway, leading Scott to further pursue locomotive design, believing there was a market for machines like his on logging railways all over the country. His finalized design was simple. It was essentially a vertical boiler mounted on a flatbed car with its cylinders set in the middle pointed downwards like a marine engine. The cylinders connected to a drive shaft and two-speed gearbox, which in turn connected to both sets of bogies and powered them through a series of gears. For extra traction, the boiler was mounted above the front set of bogies and the water tank was mounted over the rear. The frames of the engine were made of wood and a simple open cab was mounted over the whole array. Arrangement. The simple design, coupled with the wooden frames, made the engine cheap to build, sell, and repair. Scott approached the Climax Manufacturing Company with the designs, who agreed to build them, and in 1888, the first four locomotives were completed. Because of his limited education, Scott had sought the aid of his brother-in-law, George D. Gilbert, to help draw the designs of the locomotives and file the patent for it, as Gilbert had worked with steam engines before. Gilbert, however, filed the patent in his own name, with no mention of Scott, causing considerable legal trouble later on. His patents, however, came with its own issues. The wheels of the engine were driven with differential gears, the idea being that wheels on one side of the axle would be able to rotate freely to help the engine negotiate tighter turns. In reality, this left half the wheels on the locomotive unpowered, which significantly reduced its tractive effort. An engineer at the Climax Company, Rush S. Battles, then patented an improved design which used beveled gears to drive the wheels. Later drawings had the boiler be much bigger and mounted horizontally along with its cylinders, making it look more like a conventional steam locomotive. And once again, this patent was filed without a single mention of Scott. Scott, fed up with the disrespect, filed a lawsuit against Gilbert and Battles before submitting his own patent. Scott's new patent combined the basic design and two-speed gearbox of Gilbert's engine with the beveled gearing of Battles, but this time with casing around the gears for protection and to contain lubrication for said gears. Scott won the lawsuit and rights to the patent, but was left penniless as a result, hardly making any kind of profit from his engine. The Climax Company continued to build these engines regardless, with them eventually being known as Class A types. On average, they had a tractive effort of 13,200 pounds in first gear, 6,600 in second, and a top speed of 10 miles an hour. They were capable of negotiating tight bends with ease, and their bogies were sprung, allowing them to traverse bumpy and poorly laid rails without derailing. The cabs were initially open by design, but later changed to being closed, providing crews with much better protection from the weather. They were also quite spacious, which made them popular with both engine crews and loggers, as there was more than enough room for passengers to ride in the cab on rainy days. The Class A's were easy to modify too. Many were built to different gauges, from 2 foot narrow to 9 foot broad, and their wheels could be changed out accordingly to the rails they'd be running on. Smooth, standard wheels for regular rails, grooved or cleated wheels for wooden rails, and concave wheels for pole roads. As the years went on, the design was improved. Steel frames were used in place of wood, metal cabs replaced wooden boards, and the vertical boilers were swapped for T-shaped and, later, regular horizontal boilers. Four Class A's were built with an 040 wheel arrangement for use in Tionesta Valley, but no more were built after they were found to be underpowered. The popularity of the engines led to the Climax Manufacturing Company ceasing production of their other products and rebranding themselves the Climax 
Trimax Locomotive Works to focus purely on building locomotives. Despite their instant success, demand for a more powerful model grew, and so in 1893, the Class B was introduced. Two Class Bs had been built in 1891 following Battles' original patent. The boiler was larger and horizontal, with the cylinders mounted either side of it towards the front, driving a transverse shaft which in turn powered the main drive shaft. These engines, however, were unsuccessful, as the multiple gear system present in the Class A's were very difficult to incorporate into the Class B's. As a result, the engine's gearing was overly complicated and problematic. When the new version of the Class B's were put into production in 1893, they had the complex gearing removed and their cylinders were angled 25 degrees downwards. This made them considerably more reliable, and just like the Class A's, they were a massive success. These two came in all shapes and sizes, initially using round firebox T-shaped boilers before switching to regular square fireboxes, then changing the boilers to tapered designs instead of parallel. Further improvements included strengthening the frames and changing the Stevenson valve gear to all shards. In 1897, the last variant of these engines was produced in the form of the Class C. These were essentially the same as the Class B, but with an extra bogey for additional traction and power. The easily modifiable nature of the A's and the power and reliability of the B's and C's made the locomotive some of the most popular engines on logging railroads all across the US and Canada. But despite Scott fighting for the patent to be in his name, the A's, B's and C's were all commonly known as Climax locomotives. It's noted that even though way more Shea locomotives were sold compared to Climax engines, the gearing and drive mechanisms of the Shays meant they had poorer suspension and often derailed on tracks that the Climaxes could traverse with ease. The Whitmere Steel Company started logging operations in 1912 with a 16-year-old Class B Climax. But as the old engine was showing signs of wear and tear, the company splashed out for a new Shea to help with the work. Not only did the Shea continuously derail, but could only pull half the load the old Climax could. Eventually, the Shea was put to one side and the Climax was pressed back into regular service. Climax Locomotive Works produced just over a thousand locomotives of all weights and sizes, with the locomotives not only working on logging railroads, but also in mines, plantations, brickyards, short lines, and as shunting engines on heavy freight yards. They even found themselves working in Australia, New Zealand, and many other countries around the world. Unfortunately, the Climax craze couldn't last forever, and by the late 1920s, demand for logging locomotives greatly decreased. Production of locomotives ceased altogether once the company was sold to the General Parts Corporation in 1928. The company continued to make spare parts for the locomotives, but by the end of the 1930s, the factory was sold off and demolished. As steam was replaced by petrol and diesel power, some Climaxes found themselves refitted with internal combustion engines, as their design made it relatively straightforward to swap out the boiler for an engine block. But eventually, most simply vanished along with the logging roads they worked on. Fortunately, a few of these engines have been preserved, and a handful are still in working order. While not the most well-known or numerous logging locomotives, the Climaxes certainly made their mark in railroad history. Their power, reliability, and general ease to repair combined with their unique design made them the perfect machines for not just logging, but many industrial applications too. Just goes to show then that, sometimes, all it takes to get the job done is a good climax. Subscribe for more.